Good morning, everyone. Bienvenue to Le Monde ici for cette ceremony de presse. To begin with, let me acknowledge that we are standing on the traditional and unceded territories of the Algonquian, Algonquin, and Nishnabog people. It's my great pleasure to introduce the president of the Horatio Alger Association, Prem Watson. I won't give a lengthy introduction. I will simply say that I refer to Prem as the chancellor, because when I was at the University of Waterloo, Prem was the chancellor, and we pay great respect to the chancellor. Mr. Chancellor, please. Good morning, everyone. Very nice to see all of you, and a warm, warm welcome. Um, good to have you here. When I say David, I'm uh, always reminded of David's story that he's told me so many times. And uh, you all perhaps haven't uh, heard of it. David came from Sault Ste. Marie, born in Sudbury, Sault Ste. Marie, and hockey was a big sport in Sault Ste. Marie. So the story goes that um, a coach called up the key player and said, you haven't passed your math exam and uh, we can't play you in this uh, finals unless you pass your math exam. But I have, fortunately, the principal said, I can ask you one question, and if you answer that question, you can play. So uh, he's in the, uh, in the uh, dressing room with all of the players. He calls the player in and he says, one question, focus intently on me, what is two plus two? Good hockey player, he takes some time. He said, think carefully. He says, four. And the coach is excited, and he says, is that your answer? And just when he's, uh, just when he's ready to give them a nice, you know, you're ready to play, the bench comes back and says, all of the young boys say, coach, give him another chance. <laughs> But it is, uh, David always tells me about this, and I laugh and I think about it. We've had some great times together. And um, it is so nice to welcome all of you to uh, this uh, Horatio Alger uh, meeting, Voices of the Youth Press Conference. So um, I welcome you, and thank you for attending this exciting event, announcing the results of the first ever Horatio Alger Association of Canada Voices of the Youth Survey. It's a survey of young Canadians right across Canada. There's a thrilling moment for our association as we approach our 10th anniversary in Canada. We have a great deal to celebrate and a great deal to look forward to. This may be the first exposure many of you have to the Horatio Alger Association, so I'd like to tell you a little about the association, and the best way to do that is in the form of a video. So. Uh, can we have that video, please? The Horatio Alger Association of Canada was founded in 2009 to celebrate the idea that through hard work, honesty, and determination, individuals can reach their highest potential. Each year, the association inducts new members and presents them with the prestigious International Horatio Alger Award. Award recipients become part of a select group of exceptional Canadians who have triumphed over adversity. Members strive to provide promising young people with the support education and confidence needed to realize their dreams. Beginning in 2019, a total of 200 need-based scholarships of $5,000 and $10,000 will be bestowed to students from every province and territory representing a value of $1.2 million annually. Since 2012, over $3.19 million in scholarships have been awarded to 645 deserving young Canadians. 
the Horatio Alger Association of Canada, honoring perseverance, integrity, and excellence. I must say that the Horatio Alger Association is a very inspirational organization and uh, you can see it from that video and you'll see it in this morning as we talk about it. Uh, the Horatio Alger Association of Canada is proud to announce the results of the first ever Voices of Our Youth survey. The groundbreaking study was conducted in partnership with Nanos Research and the Center for the Study of Educational Leadership and, and Policy at Simon Fraser University. The survey is the first of its kind in Canada. As part of our extensive polling throughout the summer, Canadians aged 14 to 23 years from coast to coast were questioned on a wide variety of political, social, economic, educational, and personal issues. The study seeks to give a voice to the opinions, perspectives, and concerns of young Canadians at this point in our nation's history. A similar study has been conducted every year for four years, every four years in the United States by our American affiliate, the Horatio Alger Association of Distinguished Americans. We are very fortunate to be hugely supported by the American Association. The state of our nation's youth survey has been an authoritative voice for what young people south of the border believe it to be the most relevant and important issues for that generation since its inception in 1997, about 21 years ago. We hope voices of our youth will serve the same purposes in Canada. Contrary to popular assumptions and conventional wisdom about today's youth, our findings show that young Canadians hold many of the same values as older generations. They value hard work, they want financial stability, they appreciate the freedoms guaranteed in Canada, and they have a keen interest in helping their communities and promoting equality. But they also face new challenges and anxieties. I don't want to repeat too much of what our next two speakers will present, but suffice to say that the results of the study make me very optimistic for the future of Canada. In fact, they reinforce the values that define our association. Hard work, perseverance, and determination. Of the key findings, 79% of respondents, that's 79, almost 80% of respondents, believed hard work was more important for success in life than luck. As for the factors that lead to a successful life, the two top responses were financial well-being and helping others. The study also has some important implications for our association. For example, three quarters of those who deferred or planned to defer attending post-secondary educational institutions after high school cite a lack of financial resources, a lack of financial resources as the reason why they could not go to university. Uh, our association, as you saw, helps 200 students every year attend university through our scholarship of $5,000 to $10,000. While the members of the association are humble to help these young people, we are very much aware that there's always more that can be done. That's what we strive to do. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome up our first speaker. He is the chief data scientist and founder of Nanos Research and is one of Canada's most respected posters. Please welcome Nick Nanos. Nick. Uh, thanks, Prem. Uh, I'd actually like to start off by saying that the uh, Horatio Alger Association is an exceptional organization, and what you're going to get today is a look at a very exciting piece of research that puts a spotlight, as Prem says, brings the voice of youth to the table. It puts a spotlight on how youth are feeling and kind of their day-to-day -day lives. And uh, when you look at this particular project, it was, it was a lot of fun to work with uh, Michelle and her colleagues. 
Uh, it was an excellent collaboration. Uh, Nanos, for all intents and purposes, helped collaborate on the questionnaire with Michelle and her colleagues and developed a questionnaire that was consistent with the U.S. methodology. We were the, uh, I'm not sure what the right word is, but we were the backbone, at least, from a data perspective, and then we collaboratively worked on the interpretation of the data, and Michelle led uh, the, the research and analysis. What I like about this particular project is not just the insight that it brings to the table, but the fact that it is sharing. What do I mean by sharing? What it does is the Horatio Alger Association will be sharing this research with educators, policymakers, young people, politicians, people in the community, so that they can take a look at it and become engaged on youth issues. And when we think about the methodology, and it might sound like a long time ago, but actually this survey was only completed seven weeks ago, which is another reason why we should thank Michelle for the great job that she and her team did. We surveyed uh, 2,070 high school students and graduates from the ages of 14 to 23. They participated in an online survey, you know, a 20-minute online survey, and you know, many times I usually say uh, the importance that respondents put on a survey is indicative of the participation rate and their level of engagement. Just the topic, and is interesting, when we look and we're crunching the numbers, it was very clear that Canadians used, are very engaged on this particular issue. So, what do we have? What we have is what I would call a rigorous benchmark to measure where we will be in the future. And if there are some key takeaways and I'm going to just put a couple things on the table, and Michelle is going to go into them in a little more detail. If there are some key takeaways, one, the theme of resilience and hard work. Young people are focused, driven, resilient, hardworking people that are ambitious for the future. Two, the other thing that struck me was what I'll call the generosity of spirit. That it wasn't just about themselves. When it came to issues like reconciliation with Canada's Indigenous peoples, they were at the front of the pack. When it came to kind of having a more compassionate society and being more, I'll call it, communitarian and engaged in the community, they were at the front of the pack. So we have to remember that you have to think of this resilient, hardworking individual with a generosity of a spirit. The other thing that popped in terms of the data was anxiety. And it's not all good news. And as Prem alluded to, there's a significant level of anxiety about finances. I want, I have the ambition to go to university and college, but I'm worried about how much that will cost and the finances of that. So, if you are interested in youth as our future leaders, if you are interested in a better community, country, world, this study is for you. So I'm going to uh, introduce my colleague, Michelle, and then pass it over to her to put a spotlight on this. So she, Michelle, Dr. Michelle Pigeon led the preparation of the 2018 Voices of Youth report, along with her team of researchers from Simon Fraser. She analyzed the report, which is based on the NANOS data. Uh, Dr. Pigeon is an associate professor in the Faculty of Education, director in the Center for the Study of Educational Leadership and Policy, that's a mouthful, at Simon Fraser University and a higher edu education scholar. So when you think of this report, think of quality data and insight melded with expert insight from a leading thinker, educator in this particular area. So without any further ado, I'd like to invite Michelle to come up to chat about the study. Thank you. Well, bonjour everyone, thank you so much. It's a great honor to be here and I just want to raise my hands and thanks as we do in the Coast Salish territories um, for the warm welcome and the support of the Horatio Algier Association and the team that has gone behind this report and today's event. Um, it's truly an honor to be part of it. Uh, Nick, it was a great time working with you. You can tell he has a great personality so you can just assume what our phone calls were like over the last few months um, and emails. So. Um, I also want to raise my hands and thanks to Andrea Lavalier, who is the research assistant who worked with us on this project. Um, she's put an immense amount of time in, into the report, and I think it's important to just acknowledge her time. So, 
just to share a few of the findings. As we've already alluded, our youth today are very um, valued and they feel that there's a lot of factors that are going to attribute to what they see as having a successful life. So it's not just about having financial stability, of course that's an important part to them, but also having a sense of hard work is important to have for a successful life. It's also important that they value and want to contribute to equitable society. I think that's a core value and the values that our young people have are evident in the responses to the rest of the survey questions. They have a cautious optimism for Canada, and I don't want that to be perceived as something negative. I think they have a cautious optimism because they know the challenges and struggles, but also the opportunities that are ahead for them. And I think it ties back to this opportunity of post-secondary education aspirations, which I'll allude to a little later. When we asked young people what they felt were the most important um, issues they felt that Canada as a country needed to address in the oncoming years, there were a few things that I think are important that tie back to the values that they hold dear to their hearts. One is increasing access to affordable housing. The second was making sure people of all races are treated equally in this country. They want to address issues of poverty and homelessness in Canada. And they also want to address the economic gap between rich and poor. They also felt that cutting taxes and reducing government spending was important. So as future voters, I think it's important as we think about how are we going to attract more young people to vote, we have to start attracting and targeting the things that they care about. And also thinking about they're really concerned about the environment and protecting environmental securities in the country. When we think about reconciliation in this country, it has had a big conversation. But I think, how are young people feeling about it was an important part for me to think about. And they felt that the government overall could be doing more to support Indigenous issues, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. But they also felt that they understood the impact of residential school and the intergenerational trauma experienced by Indigenous peoples across the country. And they also felt that all Canadians are responsible for the calls to action. And in terms of thinking where the government could be providing more support for Indigenous people, they felt that they could be doing more around culture and language programming, which aligns well with the media around how we're thinking about language revitalization, where we're thinking about educational engagement and opportunities for Indigenous youth. When we asked them about the tech, their use of technology and the impact of technology in their lives, there were positive and not so positive responses in thinking about where they saw technology. So technology was helpful in terms of finding research, being able to access information. Social media is their primary source of information when they come to get news and what's happening in the world. Second to that were family and friends. Um, and thinking about while they felt it had help with their technology skills, it also had some negative impact in terms of their relationship with their parents and guardians, a little less so with their friends, um, their attention spans, and their physical activity. So leading to what Prem and uh, Nick were talking about, our young people are facing multiple stressors. It's not just about having um, their opportunities, but their pressure to have their life all figured out. That was something that kind of stood out for us in the course. And when we think about the sources of pressure, it was really a combination between their own self-pressure and the pressure that probably parents and guardians and expectations to go to university or college, um, things like that. When we asked them what age they felt young people should have financial independence, contrary to other reports, our scholar or young people felt that their age was 22. So at 22, they felt young people should have financial independence from their young, uh, parents. For those in the audience who are that age group, you don't concerns that they have their post-secondary and that we asked or people felt that they're supporting uh, sorry that they're not feeling pressure to do drugs um, which is interesting given the uh, change in national law around cannabis use however 40 percent of our high school students and 37 percent of our graduate students felt they were being reported being bullied either online or in person which I think is an important factor and another stressor that young people are facing and something that we need to be paying attention to in Canada. And stress overall is having a major impact on their lives where uh, thinking about mental health, self-esteem, and their physical health. So it's not just one issue and it's not just one aspect of their lives that's being impacted by these stressors. Like 
Canadians, our general high um, education completion rates in this country, our young people also have aspirations to go on to post-secondary education, whether it's university or college. And as Harma had mentioned, that there are some who are choosing to delay post-secondary because of financial need, either needing to work full-time, supporting their families, um, or thinking about um, where they're going. And fewer young people, a very small percentage of the survey respondents, are, choos are choosing not to go on to post-secondary because they felt that the opportunities ahead for them didn't require a post-secondary education. It's less than 5%. So it goes back then to the concerns around finances that was a little bit of a theme and the value around equality and making sure folks had access and equal opportunity, addressing issues of rich and poor. When we asked them specifically about how they're thinking about financing their post-secondary education, what was interesting is that a lot of young people are debt averse, meaning they don't want to take out repayable loans that are going to accrue interest for their post-secondary education. And so when we ask them about how are they thinking about paying for their education, again, parents in the room, um, they're, gonna, they're thinking their parents, their own personal savings, so hence the connection to work and employment, are going to be the things that are going to support their financial costs. I think the th important thing to think about is that when we talk about financing post-secondary education, it's not just about the tuition costs, it's not just about the cost of books and supplies, but it's also about the cost of living, the co cost of your hometown and go into a larger urban center, if you're choosing to go across provinces, thinking about the multiple costs that get accumulated into a four-year or two-year degree. And that are the main key findings of our report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick, and thank you, uh, Michelle. I love the statement that both of you made, hardworking, but with a generosity of spirit. Sort of defines Canada, does it not? And um, so it's very nice to, for you all to put your study um, out. Um, as Nick mentioned, over 2,000 young people from across the country took part in our study. And so we'd like to speak to a few of them. Uh, to moderate a panel of Horatio Alger scholarship recipients, I have the distinct pr privilege of welcoming up a very good friend of mine, as you already know. He joined us as the 14th member this year, 14th member of the Horatio Alger Association, is our former Governor General, David Johnston. So please um, uh, welcome David Johnston, um, who will moderate a panel of the scholars. Our panelists, come on up here. You want to welcome? Thank you. Jasmine, welcome. Bienvenue. Catherine, welcome. Well, thank you, all three of you, Horatio Alger Association scholars, to uh, this conference. And we have just heard about voices of youth. And you're the voices behind the voices. So let's hear some of your observations on what went on. I won't give you a detailed introduction of each of these three sparkling young people. Uh, you have that in your press handout. But let me begin with you, Catherine, and ask each of the three of you, just give us a brief snapshot of who you are, where you're from, where you're studying, and one thing about you that we should know that would be kind of interesting or surprising. Okay. Start with um, you, Catherine. Okay, cool. So, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Catherine Key. I was born and raised in Toronto, Ontario but I currently study at Western University for Health Sciences in London, Ontario, which is not too far away from Toronto. Um, and something interesting about me, a fun fact would be, when I was little, um, what I wanted to be when I grew up, my dream was to be a princess, which is such a stereotypical little girl thing to dream of. Um, so I was obsessed with Disney princesses, even though I never even watched a single movie. I just loved their dresses, and I was like, oh my god, I want to be them when I grow up. So, yeah, fun fact. And you still believe that? That's what you want to be? Yes, it's, it's still in the back of my mind. Jonah, what about you? <laughs> Tell us about yourself and one, or maybe even two characteristics, because the one you mentioned to me yesterday is really unusual. Hello, everybody. My name is Jonah Larson. 
I'm from Halifax, Nova Scotia, but I'm currently attending the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, studying engineering. Um, I'm very entrepreneurial. I've started multiple businesses. And a fun fact about me is that I can solve a Rubik's Cube in 25 seconds. 25 seconds. <laughs> Joan, it takes some of us 25 seconds to pick it up and put it in our hand. <laughs> uh, just tell us, what was your first entrepreneurial activity of part of 25 seconds on the Rubik's Cube? The very first thing that I did that was entrepreneurial was when I was about 13 or 14, I was editing videos of my friends playing video games for money, and then they got their friends to come to me. And so I started that as sort of a part-time side hustle while in junior high. And you made some money out of it. I did make some money out of it. Never looked back. No, not <laughs> since then. Jasmine, tell us about yourself and one surprising characteristic that we should know about, or maybe one we shouldn't know about. And I'm from uh, Manitoba. I go to the University of Manitoba. And I'm studying my Bachelor of Science uh, with a focus on genetics. And um, one fun fact about me uh, is I'm allergic to everything. <laughs> yeah. Everything. I mean, most of people's staple foods I can't eat. Oh, so that gives you an interest in nutrition yeah. and in health and in research. And that's kind of a career path definitely, for you. Definitely, that's something that sparked it for sure. But you're also on the entrepreneurial side. Uh, we were talking about nutrition, and one of the many things you did as a young person was you um, had uh, market gardens, and you went to one the uh, open air market in your hometown, and then another town uh, not too far away, and did very well selling vegetables. Yeah, um, I went around surrounding communities with. Um, I went with um, a camp that was an entrepreneurial camp, and I did a lot of ventures with um, vegetables, food, products, and I sold it and marketed the idea of home-based vegetables and mm -hmm. products. Et tu parles français, n'est-ce pas? Oui, je parle français. C'est bon. So one of the major findings of the study, which is quite interesting, was the question of um, uh, which is more important? Is it uh, hard work or is it good luck? <clears throat> and I think 79% opted for hard work. Jonah, why don't you respond to that and give your sense of this issue of, of um, hard work, uh, good luck? Okay. Yeah, I think it's, it's something that's very interesting to me. So I believe that both hard work and luck are very important, but you really aren't going to succeed in life without hard work. But the whole point of hard work is so that you can persevere through challenges and get to a point where you, you get lucky and you reach an opportunity and then you need to apply that hard work to the situation in order to succeed. So it's not really one or the other, yeah. it's that you need both. Yeah. yeah, and you were also commenting on the nature of hard work and you spoke about hard work not as a one point of time but persistence. And I dare say from your own life you're also speaking about work smart, mm. not simply hard work really emphasize the working smart and using your time pretty effectively. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. I think that using time effectively is a lot more important than just working very hard at something. You know, I see a lot of people who would work very hard at part-time jobs, and that was something that I was never really interested in. I always wanted to gather more value from it, either, even if I made less money. So that's why I was starting businesses at a young age, because the experience of it was so much more valuable than the money that I would have gotten from using that same time in a part-time job. Yeah. Catherine, what's your take on that? Good luck or hard work or both? Yeah, I definitely agree with Jonah in that uh, both do play a role, but I'm also kind of opposite from him in the fact that I think that everyone is born with luck. Um, some people have a lot more luck than others, but no matter how humble of beginnings you start at or whatever challenges um, you are placed in um, at a young age, I think that everyone has luck and has opportunities. Um, but then from there, I don't think a successful, to, I don't think you can be successful by just like having all your faith in just being lucky and lucky and lucky over again. I think you have to take that luck and take advantage of that and then reach, you, um, reach that opportunity and actually hold on to it and work hard from that. Um, and yeah, I think just hard work is the catalyst that will bring you to be successful. Luck can't do it by itself, but I do think everyone has some sort of luck. They just gotta have that optimism and keep, try to find that luck. 
So Jasmine, what do you do in this wonderful country of ours when for a particular individual, a young person, the luck is really, really bad and it's persistent, really, really bad. A little tough to get on the track to a Horatio Alger scholarship or post-secondary education. You've never had a book in your home. Um, you don't really have a decent place to sleep at night. Pretty hard to do any homework. No encouragement whatsoever to think beyond just today. How do you handle that? Right, um, with scarce opportunity, I mean, that comes the real challenge and that really brings out character. And I think really we are, like Catherine said, and as well as Jonah, it's a combination of luck and hard work, but we all are presented with good luck and bad luck, whether that brings us adversities, um, opportunities, it doesn't matter what our upbringings are, but it is harder for some people and they, they go through a lot more hardships than others. So I think in that case, um, it's all about the character and the way that they react to those adversities and the way they grow upon that and self-instruction, being an autodidact and really showing that you can overcome those and apply that to your life and help others with that. And really with that situation, it's very, you have such an amazing opportunity to change the world with those experiences. Mm -hmm. So Jonah, we were chatting about this yesterday and we talked a little bit about difficult concepts, equality of opportunity, mm -hmm. equality and equity. Mm -hmm. You've got some thoughts on the differentiation amongst those yeah. uh, different categories. That's something that I'm very interested in because I noticed in the study, uh, the participants were asked to rank the changes that they wanted to see made in Canadian society, something along those lines. And a lot of them ranked equity increasing equity as a primary value of theirs. And so it's something that I've really thought about is, is the difference between equality and equity. And the way that I would see that is equality is equality of opportunity and equity is equality of outcome or pushing for a group of people to achieve the same thing no matter where they started or what they do. And so it's, it's, it's a very tricky um, concept. And it's not something that I can give a very clear answer to, but I do have a very good question in regards to it, which is to create a society where there are a lot less of the problems that we see today, is it better for the government and nonprofit organizations to push for equity or for equality? So, Catherine, a very famous US educator, John Gardner, wrote a book that posed the question, can we have equality of opportunity and excellence too? Can we see those as mutually reinforcing qualities or mutually uh, destroying qualities that one competes with the other? What do you think about that? Equality of opportunity and excellence too. I think, I think that it is possible. Right. Um, I obviously don't have the answers. Um, like Jonas said, I'm not really sure, I'm also not really sure if we should push for equality or equity just because equity, the downside to equity would be um, if, let's see, say like the rich are here and the, or the disadvantaged and poor are here. I don't know if equity would be to push the poor up or push the rich down or if, like Jonah said the other day, equality would be to raise both, which would be preferred or, you know, so I'm not really sure, um, but definitely I think it is possible. We just have to keep trying. So one of the really interesting findings well, the study for me is we think of Generation Z, that is those people born from the mid-1990s on, roughly in the age bracket of 14 to 24, which was the survey sample, is pretty self-centered, focused on their own career. Um, first person singular, not first, plur not first person plural. I, not we. Mm -hmm. Not so, it's quite the opposite. Uh, and in particular, concern for the other, um, concern for racial equality, concern about homelessness, poverty, accessible housing, concern about financing higher education, et cetera, uh, and particularly given to, to volunteer activity. And each of the three of you have been involved in a range of volunteer activities, some very distinguishing ones. Do you want to comment on some of your experiences on helping the other, the volunteer, Jasmine? Yeah, sure. Um, I think especially for high school students and students that are in any level of education, the first destination you should be going to for volunteer is school. And that's exactly where I started, is at school. And that spanned out to community uh, volunteer 
And after that, it just became something that we all volunteer on a daily basis, um, whether we realize it or not, opening the door for somebody that's just being nice, but we all help people out carrying their groceries if they need help. And just volunteering with daycares and childcare places and healthcare and being a, a genuinely good person, a humanitarian, just every day applying that to your life, I think that's what I try to do. But. Catherine, tell us a bit about your voluntary experiences and activities that you've been involved in, but how you've been associated with some of your chums, that it kind of is contagious, huh? Yeah. And, and how does that happen? Um, for sure. So um, a huge passion of mine uh, is the topic of homeless and at-risk youth. Um, so I've been involved um, with a lot of philanthropic uh, projects um, in my school and in my community regarding that. Uh, so the past few years, I worked with this charity um, shelter called Horizons for Youth, which is local in Toronto. Um, and through a lot of um, leading school events and initiatives and assemblies, uh, educational assemblies, um, we managed to raise a few thousand dollars toward that charity and I went to the charity to visit some of their youth. Um, and what really inspired me to, to get involved in this uh, originally was because um, a lot of the difficulties youth face, there's a stigma against them, but people don't often realize that um, they most of them come from very disadvantaged homes, uh, very broken homes, um, but a lot of people just put the label on them that they're druggies or they're high school dropouts or you know they're lazy, that they just got themselves in this situation. Um, but I could definitely relate to some of the hardships that a lot of them tend to face at home. Um, so that really had me, that really got, I got very emotionally attached to this issue when I first heard of it. Um, in a middle school assembly when a speaker came in to talk about it. Um, so that kind of really inspired me to make the push to actually get active and try to find ways to help. So Jonah, tell us a bit about your volunteer activities. How you move from first person singular to first person plural? Well, one of the, the proudest achievements that I've, I've done, well, there's, there's only been a few, but like the, the thing that's, that's the primary pr proud achievement with regards to charity was um, I started a business with my father, and so my father growing up, it was, it was a huge stressor because he was very poor and often um, he would complain about not having enough money and it was stressful for me as a child. And even at some, some points, uh, he couldn't afford food, so he had to go to the food bank. And so then about two years ago, I was really getting into entrepreneurship and I wanted to take it to the next level and start a real business. And he had experience in screen printing and so him and I came together and we started a screen printing company called Metro Screen Prints. So I worked for like a, a month or two working out the business plan, making the website, making the marketing plan all myself. And he set up the screen printing machine and the prices. And the, what was really important to me with this organization was helping out in some way. Because, you know, it's, it, we help out businesses by making custom t-shirts for them but that's not really helping people in need. So what we decided to do was give 1% of all of our revenue to a local food bank that my dad and I have had to use in the past at times. And that, that really aligns with my values, which is giving back to the people who gave to me when I was in need. So what we expect from you, Jonah, for an encore is a systematic <laughs> or systems approach, and that is how do we put food banks in this country out of business? That's a really good question. Um, I think that a lot of the time, the trouble with the food bank is that people who need to go don't actually go. And you see this problem with homeless shelters as well, is people are too ashamed to actually use them. And that's something that my dad spoke to me about. He said, if, you, if you're actually in a time of need, there are so many organizations that are there to help you. And if you reach out and get that help, then it's just that much faster that you will be able to recover and get to a point where you don't need to go anymore. So Catherine, Jasmine, give, give me your take on this. What's so fascinating about Jonah's story is uh, a business as a mid-teenager with his dad doing the business plan, dad having come from a difficult business experience of his own. Um, and so you run the successful business and then with the commitment that percent of the revenues would go to the food bank. Normally we learn volunteerism from our parents, say from our family. 
here's a situation where you brought your father into the circle. And I think you, I think your father found a very great deal of satisfaction of working with his son on this business and with this altruistic purpose. And so pick up on that, Catherine, and where do we learn that kind of spirit? Normally, you think of from parent to child. Here's we have a reversal in this situation. Tell us about your thoughts on yeah. speaking about young people. How do we learn about that dealing with the other, dealing with beyond me, dealing with volunteerism? Yeah, for sure. I think um, it's very important for all of us to have like an inner drive. Um, I think especially like for us, I think we can all relate. We came from very humble backgrounds and um, a lot of the times negativity was just thrown at us and it's very hard to find that inspiration um, from uh, the people who are close with us just because they lacked hope at the time as well. So um, we just, when we're put into those situations, we're just forced to look within ourselves um, and within the drive that we have and the hope that we have and we have to hold on to that. Um, and we have to hope for, we have to have the hope for something better and we have to work towards that because it's lacking around us. So I think it's very important for all of us to have good role models and to have that inspiration externally, but I think it's very, very important that when that is lacking, we also have to look within ourselves and, and really talk to ourselves about what we want to do and how we want to act. How about you, Jasmine? How do we learn the spirit of volunteerism? I think it's just, again, um, a factor of character. And it's not something you're born with, it's something you learn and you're surrounded by um, different people who have different opinions and drives, like Catherine said. And it's just about going beyond those circumstances, those experiences. And me, I was very lucky. My mother is an amazing role model. Um, but there's also negative role models and you just have to go beyond those and really think for yourself and have the drive and want to make a difference and want other people to not go through what you went through or to help them out and get past that obstacle and show them that they can come above it and make something great out of it. Alors, Jasmine, tu parles français et je vais poser la question en français. Tu as passion pour la recherche médicale, carrière comme chercheur médical dans la santé. Pourquoi? Pourquoi vous avez tout à cette passion? Ah ben, c'est une combination de j'ai des maladies et j'ai commencé ça parce que c'était toujours un, un, un problème pour moi parce que je ne pouvais pas manger des choses que les autres pouvaient manger et je ne pouvais pas aller dehors comme les autres parce que j'ai des problèmes avec mes doigts euh, et le gel quand c'est trop froid, c'est Reynolds. Et euh, je veux faire des recherches pour qu'il y aura des traitements pour les personnes comme ça, parce que pour moi, il n'y avait pas une option et euh, tout le monde était toujours comme... Il pensait que c'était bizarre. Mm -hmm. So, c'est juste... Euh, ça commence avec mes expériences personnelles et autre que ça, comme la diabète. Mm -hmm. J'ai fait beaucoup de recherches sur ça, spécialement pour les... Uh, les personnes um, uh, autochtones et sur réserve. Sur, uh, donc, je veux faire un contribution pour. Tell us a little bit more about that particular interest: diabetes, yeah. Manitoba, an epidemic, uh, some very, very serious issues. Um, why is that so, and what are we doing about it? What are you going to do about it? Uh, well. <coughs> currently, and it has been going on for a long time, and I'm sure it is ameliorating in some aspects, but uh, there's still a huge plight for the people living in um, northern reserves, and other reserves, of course. Um, they're having uh, fiscal issues as well as nutritional, and what I'm focusing on in my research is their nutritional uh, deprivation, which is um, mostly part um, and parcel of their lack of vegetation. And it's the climate in northern regions of Canada, and for me, I live in Manitoba, um, they have a shorter growing season for, these, uh, for this vegetation. And so I believe a solution for that would be to implement aeroponics or vertical farming, which is an indoor greenhouse approach, which would allow them to not only uh, make a profit and be able to support their community in that way and advance 
but it would also be able to nourish them and not have to pay $20 for a head of cabbage. So, and more than half of the people on reserves do want to eat healthier and they do want to um, improve their nutrition, but it's just not feasible for them. So we expect, uh, Jasmine, that you and Catherine and Jonah will get together as systems engineers and number one, you're gonna put food banks out of business and number two, we're really gonna wrestle this problem of diabetes amongst our Hopefully. indigenous people to the ground, eh? For sure. And with them, nothing about us without us, huh? <laughs> So, you know, it's not very often that you get three experts on a subject all together and you can get free advice. So we're going to get some free advice right now. Terry, where are you? Terry Giroux? Terry, okay, we're, we're going to listen pretty carefully here. Prem, we're going to listen pretty carefully. We're going to get advice on what do you do with this marvelous study, Voices of the Young in Canada, about the needs, the opportunities, the hope, the challenges, et cetera. That's point one. What do, how do we put legs on that study? And number two, um, Advise Pram and Terry and others of what you would do with this program that's now 10 years old in Canada, the Ratio Alger Association Scholarship, 200 students this year, and make it better. So Catherine, we'll start with you, and then Jonah, and then you, Jasmine. Okay, sweet. Um, so I'll just start with the second point, because um, I just have it in my mind. Um, but we were all talking about this um, earlier, but um, I wouldn't really change anything about like the programming of the association, because I think it's just amazing. Um, but the networking and the marketing, I would um, make some changes. Um, I just, just because I think it's such an amazing, amazing organization, but not a lot of people know about it. Um, like when I got the scholarship and when I was preparing for my trip to Washington, I told a lot of my teachers about it and how I would be away, but none of them really knew about it. Um, so I think it's really important to market it through so social media, because that's where all the young people are, um, and also through schools, because I know Jasmine heard about it from her guidance counselor, and I saw it through Facebook. Um, so I think that's very important. Um, yeah, if you want to go down the road. And then. Yeah, sure. So what happened, if you don't know, for the scholarship is they gave us $2,500 a year, and we got to go to Washington for like four or five days and meet all the scholars from across North America and also got to meet a lot of the members of the association, which are distinguished Americans and Canadians that have already succeeded, that went through adversity in their younger years. And so when I applied for the scholarship, I knew that I was gonna be getting $10,000, and I didn't really know about this event in Washington. I really didn't know it was gonna happen, and then even as it was introduced to me after I knew I got the scholarship, I didn't realize how valuable it was, like $10,000, absolutely astonishingly valuable to a struggling university student. But somehow a four day trip managed to provide even more value than that. With the people that we talked to, the conversations I had, it just completely opened up my mind to what is possible for me in my life. And so two things with that, I think that lengthening the time that we got there, especially the amount of time that we get to spend with the other scholars because there were over 100 of us and we didn't have much time to spend with each other and that was very important. And also making it a lot more clear the value that's provided through the networking and the Washington trip. Thank you. Jasmine, your advice? I think uh, it's a common theme among all of us when uh, we're saying about the marketing, just because it's just a buried treasure right now. And I mean, it's far more than just the $10,000. I mean, that's what I was applying for was the money, um, and which is understandable because we're going into university and everyone's looking at the, the dollar signs, right? But it, this, this scholarship is so much more valuable than that. And I don't think people realize that when they're, when they're looking at the options for scholarships online or when their guidance counselor presents them, they don't really look you know, where this scholarship is going to take them, the relationships they're going to build because of this, and this is a life-changing opportunity, and it's just not marketed as that to the public. And it takes maybe uh, testimonies from the scholars, past alumni now, and to really show how this impacts the people who experience this. Thank you. So, Jonah, one more bit of advice, and we talked a bit about that. At the gathering in Washington, where you were for three days, with all of these Horatio Alger scholars from across the United States and the members mm -hmm. in the Canadian group, 
they had an eagle, an American eagle, fly from one end of the ballroom about 200 yards to the other end. I thought about one foot above my head as this <laughs> eagle was coming at me. Yeah. And I'll never forget that experience. So what do we do as an, a Canadian equivalent? Do we have a moose parading through the ballroom? <laughs> And will you ride it? <laughs> I'd, I'd definitely ride the moose. You're volunteering. For that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think at the Grey Cup game, was it 1954, 56, when Calgary Stampeders were in it? They had a horse go up the oh, stairs really? of the Royal York Hotel. So we'll perhaps do a moose, <laughs> will we? Yeah. So we're down to just a, two or three minutes before we, we end up. Uh, ask each of the three of you, if you had advice to your peers on um, how you take some of your own experiences, um, and pursue your own path. What are the one or two things that you tell them? Catherine, what advice do you have for people who are two or three years younger than you are? Okay. Um, I would say that as you progress through life, um, no one progresses um, it through a straight line. It's always going to be full of bumps and turns and twists. Mm -hmm. um, but to always view whatever adversity has come your way as a blessing in disguise. That's what I always tell people. Adversity is a blessing in disguise. Um, without that, you can't grow, you can't progress, you can't overcome any challenges if there's no challenges presented to you. So I think it's very important to just have that optimistic mindset and to always view adversity as a blessing in disguise. Mm -hmm. Jasmine, you? I'm, I'm totally in agreement with Catherine again. And um, other than that, I also think that getting involved in the community at a young age and what you don't, and realizing, you know, where you are, you know, issues that are happening in your community, in society, and starting a, to build a base of research. It doesn't have to be anything significant, but really understanding why you support that, understanding the reasons why you're following certain things so you can strive to improve and involve the, the society that you're living within. Jonah? Well... I think that this relates a lot to the Washington event that I was talking about before. And it's that a lot of young people now are focused so much on trying to make money and trying to get to a point where they can make money that they lose focus on developing as a person. And that's something that was so powerful for me in the Washington trip is that I walked away from it. You know, I got the scholarship and that was separate from the trip, but the, the value of the trip was how it changed me as a person. And so seeking out experiences that can really broaden your worldview. Just talking to as many people as you can talk to, as many people as are willing to talk to you, seeking out mentors is very important. It's interesting, you know, that when you move from me to we, a great big burden falls off your shoulders, that you are no longer the most important person in the universe. There are yeah. other things that can preoccupy you, and it's pretty satisfying when you make that transition, huh? Uh, you know, I don't know about you all, but uh, when I listen to these marvelous young people and read this terrific study and think of what Horatio Alger, the association, is attempting to do to be sure that equality of opportunity works in our society for all of our citizens, for all of our young people, I get pretty excited about the future, pretty optimistic. And don't tell me that Generation Z is uh, totally wrapped up in themselves. Um, and uh, what a treat it is to be with these three young people. And, Watch what they will do over the next few years. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, Catherine, Jonah, Jasmine. Good luck, bon chance. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you very much. Well done, Jonah. Thank you. We'll ride that moose together, my yeah, friend. Hey? <laughs> in front. Well done, Catherine. So Take care. Thanks. Photo. Oh, we need that. There we go. Uh, oh, oh, to the, the left. Oh. oh, you want me in the middle. I'm not sure I can do that. There we go. Okay. I thought you were moving me to the left, and that's a political statement. Um, <laughs> my job, I know politics. Isn't that right, Prem? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Wasn't that a uh, tremendous panel? Let's recognize them again. <laughs> Equality of opportunity, they talked about. And adversity is a blessing in disguise. Wonderful statements, and um, uh, that we uh, that we have seen. And um, and um, I uh, came to Canada about 46 years ago, and I can tell you, Canada is a land of opportunity. I had no money when I came, 
uh, but was welcomed in Canada and uh, right through my 46 years. And uh, we live in a wonderful country and we are very, very fortunate. But, uh, but it's so nice to see these young scholars take advantage of the opportunity. And you pointed out um, uh, for us uh, very clearly there, um, Jonathan, that uh, it's not only the money, but it's the exposure. That Washington, I had um, many years ago, I, I, I went to Washington and that exposure um, was uh, just very inspirational to me. And that's one of the reasons I'm spending my time because I think this is um, tremendous for the young scholars. Um, so, um, so we now, just a few closing remarks. Um, as I said already, Catherine, Jonna, Jasmine, uh, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to share with this audience your experiences. Um, very, very inspirational um, in terms of what's happening with our youth. And of course, David is a natural moderator a great ambassador of uh, Canada to the world for seven years, and we are so fortunate to have uh, David with us again. And thank you for your time, David. <laughs> David uh, was the uh, 14th uh, Horatio Alger recipient, and we are so fortunate because of David's educational background and his intellect that he's going to be helping with the mentoring, developing of our scholars. Now, we've got a ton of scholars, and we're gonna have a lot more, but David and Stephen Wallace, where's Stephen? Stephen Wallace is uh, helping David, and uh, they're both in Ottawa. Let's recognize Stephen Wallace, too. Um, a special thank you to uh, Nick uh, Nanos from Nanos Research, and Dr. Michelle, uh, Pigeon of Simon Fraser University. A big thank you. Uh, all of this is uh, put together so wonderfully. It's the Horatio Alger staff who have worked together, but I do want to recognize Terry Giroux, who's a tremendous organizer, and um, Adam, who's helped us a lot. Um, Terry and Adam. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been, I think, I hope it was an inspirational morning for you. The opportunity is unlimited in this wonderful country we call Canada. And um, thank you for joining us. And David will be available, and our, our researchers also will be available to talk to any of the media. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you.